Uh, Trump is uh, supposedly, according to Politico, confiding in allies that he intends to run again in 2024 with one contingency that he still has a good bill of health. I mean, he bought one last time, so I'm sure he could get one if he wants to this time. Um, so uh, Trump is going to be there, and what that's doing is creating a cascading effect on a bunch of things. It's implicating the January 6th commission. It is, um, it is also, and, and that is, and that, it, that could end up providing at least some impetus for filibuster reform. We'll talk about that in a bit. But the other thing that it's doing is it's putting, <laughs> this is an odd, just put a pin in that. It's creating an odd uh, disincentive for the DOJ. And I will explain. Um, you've heard the story, obviously, that uh, on Tuesday night, the Manhattan District Attorney convened a special grand jury to hear uh, evidence in the investigation, the criminal investigation of the Trump organization. This is after um, we heard that the New York State Attorney General uh, was working with that same Manhattan DA on possible um, uh, criminal case in addition to the civil case they're working on. It's just a matter of time before we heard about the, uh, the, um, the special grand jury. But one other thing that sort of got lost at the beginning of the week was the ongoing court cases that are coming out of a federal judge who both handled the uh, Manafort case and um, this is, uh, I'm talking about Amy Berman Jackson. She's U.S. District Court. And looking into the way that the Mueller investigation was handled writ large. All of these things are tied together. And this judge is rather upset about what she was told by the Justice Department and the actions of the Justice Department in terms of why the Mueller investigation did not charge the president with a crime of obstruction. This is, and, and so she has been calling for the release of this memo. In fact, she asked the Justice Department to provide it. The present uh, uh, Justice Department under Merrick Garland has now filed a, a motion to basically um, prevent the release of this memo. It is a 2019 memo written in March. It was written by two senior Justice Department officials who are with the Office of Legal Counsel. This is sort of the, this is the, uh, the government's lawyers essentially assessing what is and is not, they're, they're doing interpretations of the law. So the Office of Legal Counsel can be uh, really abused. Uh, John Yu famously wrote a memo justifying the torture regime under the Bush administration from the Office of Legal Counsel. The, according to Amy Berman Jackson, she issued an opinion earlier this month saying that she had read the memo, she wants it publicly released, and she says it showed that Barr was disingenuous when he cited that memo as key to his conclusion that Trump had not broken the law and should not be charged. She said further, the reason why it was disingenuous is because department lawyers, it's the Justice Department, essentially lied to her about the internal discussions that surrounded the memo. So the present Justice Department, out of fear of politicizing their department and maintaining the, the sort of institutional integrity, is defending their, these lawyers or that memo, protecting it from being released. They released two pages of it, a partially unredacted version 
Although the redacted part seems to be the well, meat. that's that the, the parts that they didn't reveal are obviously the ones that she wants to be made public. And here's what's going on here. Um, this is a part of the memo. Over the course of the special counsel's investigation, this is written by Steve Engel, who is the head of the departments of uh, OLC, and Edward O'Callaghan, who was a senior department official who was uh, involved in supervising the Mueller investigation. It was addressed to Barr, and there's a little bit of CYA here. Cover your you-know-whats. Over the course of the special counsel's investigation, we have previously discussed these issues within the department among ourselves, with the deputy attorney general, and with you since your appointment, as well as the special counsel and his staff. Our conclusions are the product of those discussions, as well as our review of the report. This is the key. Bill Barr made his decision supposedly, and as he told the judge, and as he told the American public, by taking input from the Office of Legal Counsel. But what is clear from this memo, and I imagine would be made even more clear if we saw the redacted part, was that Bill Bart was part of developing the theory of why they shouldn't charge it. And this is and the theory in and of itself, right? The reasoning for not charging Trump is the bulk of what is redacted. Exactly. And there are two there are two elements. One is the longstanding position by the OLC that a sitting president cannot be um, prosecuted. However, this same memo says, but you can bring charges. You just can't prosecute them. You can say whether or not you, you would bring charges. And then they find in this memo that the president, according to what they surmise from the report, should not be charged with obstruction. However, they have a, they've left a clue here just to cover themselves, just a reminder uh, Attorney General Bill Barr, you helped us come to this opinion that we are now giving you and what you are now saying is what you relied on. So in other words, Bill Barr relied on the work product that was heavily influenced by his own opinion to formulate his ultimate opinion. This is like the functional equivalent of Dick Cheney leaking to a former New York Times reporter that Saddam Hussein has weapons of mass destruction, that New York Times reporter writing it in the New York Times, and then Dick Cheney going on Meet the Press and saying, I'm just quoting the New York Times, which says that there's evidence of weapons of mass destruction. That's and the incentive and the incentive that you're refer or you reference at the beginning for the Biden DOJ is to protect this kind of now proven to be, I guess, not false, but but shaky uh, firewall between the OLC and the DOJ. So, like, this is a lesson in that no matter how extreme the Trump administration was, the Biden administration is going to cover up essentially their exploitation of the institution's um, lack of, lack of, um, you know, I guess morality is not the right word, but, but, you know, Just ethics, ethics, I mean, ethics, right. And, 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 and yes, I mean, this is, this is an ongoing theme, right? When dealing with the Republicans and that is they are abusing the system. And the question is, is, you know, how do you fight that? Do you fight that by maintaining the integrity and the depoliticization of the justice department or even the perception? I mean, That's because, the look, perception. Cause they know, they know. Yes. Go on. This is, well, that, I mean, that's the point 
is that they know it's, you know, it's, it's just a perception because it would not be a politicization of the DOJ to say, okay, we can release this memo because um, uh, Jackson, the judge, wants to release it publicly because it shows there has been uh, nefarious malfeasance by the former uh, attorney general. Um, the judge's opinion concluded that rather than Barr following the OLC advice, his decision and the OLC memo were being written by the very same people at the very same time. In other words, he was involved in writing the advice that he supposedly followed. Not I mean, only, this is, oh, uh, go let me on. read one more. Not yeah. only was the attorney general being disingenuous then, but the DOJ has been disingenuous to this court with respect to the existence of a decision-making process that should be shielded by the deliberative process privilege. In other words, that the DOJ, even in trying to, to maintain the, the lack of release of this memo, is, um, is being disingenuous because the deliberative process was... Um, was in and itself disingenuous and therefore does not deserve the protection that uh, the OLC and the Justice Department claims it does. The judge also found claims made by the department to try and shield the memo from public scrutiny are so inconsistent with the evidence in the record, they are not worthy of credence. And said the department sought to obfuscate that it had set out to create a legal justification for a decision department leaders had already made, which is to not accuse the president of a crime. In other words, they had what they wanted to find, and then they basically said, we're gonna create a process that will lead us to that decision we've already made. I mean, the Biden administration's you know, attitude here is very reminiscent of when Obama came into office, came on the campaign, uh, you know, hot off the campaign trail, critiquing the Bush administration's massive amounts of abuses and did very little to roll back in any structural way the lack of oversight and laws that allowed for those abuses to happen because Democrats' attitude is, you know, well, we we want the option to be able to use these kinds of fluid parameters or the fluidity of them to our advantage if we want to do so. And they often will do so. It's not going to be so nakedly corrupt as, say, the Trump administration or the Bush administration, but they have uh, an incentive to maintain the fiction in, in themselves because, say, Biden needs to use the OLC at some point for some purpose you don't want to kind of expose that, oh, wow, there isn't this, you know, uh, siloed process um, that we're pretending that there is. So there is, you know, one hand washes the other uh, a little bit here in maintaining a fiction. That's possible. And it's also just sort of the, um, the failure to understand that upholding some principles about the um, and protect the institution doesn't work if it only is applied one half of the time. I mean, we see this with uh, the institutionalists in the Senate, the, the hesitation supposedly. And I think there, was a, uh, there, there have been in the past, I think a significant percentage of the senators who are just institutionalists. Uh, I mean, I'm not defending that position, but I think it was um, it was a, a genuine uh, perspective. And it took far too long for them to understand that, look, the institution's being abused and you are holding up uh, some type of, um, you're holding up some type of vision that doesn't exist. And you are not going to salvage the institution by applying uh, this, uh, you know, the applying these principles in, overly timid ways. Yes, there is a danger that people will see a Department of Justice that releases the memo from the OLC from uh, the prior administration as being uh, politicized. But um, to a certain extent, if 
if what they were doing was nefarious, you got to do it. But I also think that you're right. This is a they're protecting the privilege for themselves in the future because uh, you never know what they're going to want not to be released, you know, with the next set of. Uh, but but if they think that the next Donald Trump would would not release memos in this instance, I mean, they did. Right. I mean, they did. They released like who who uncovered uh, who, who had access to uh, the Pfizer reports. I mean, they've done this and they're going to do it anyways. But I know. And it's 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 amazing to me how Democrats like Biden, who fetishize institutions, especially the Senate in Biden's case. Right. Um, when those institutions are rolled back or like significantly injured by Republican e exploitation, there's in incredible reluctance to restore. Which is bizarre to me, if that's kind of one of your guiding principles. Yep.